Welcome to the My Personal Football Coach Youth Soccer Player Development Podcast, episode 16 with Dermot Drummy. Welcome to MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's Soccer Player Development Podcast. Discover all the secrets, hints and tips about soccer player development and soccer coaching from some of the leading figures in world soccer. Here's your host, Saul Isaacson Hurst. Hi guys, welcome back to another show. This week we've got a fantastic guest, uh, Dermot Drummy. Um, some of the experience of working at both Arsenal and Chelsea, very high up in the academies. Uh, thinking back about my own time in academy football, one of the great things about working at these world-class environments is actually getting the opportunity to see um, top coaches coach, uh, not only on the grass, but see how they also conduct themselves around a facility. And I can definitely say, uh, you know, seeing someone like Dermot work up close was a real fantastic influence on me. And uh, I'm sure you're going to enjoy this uh, this podcast. Really enjoyable. It's got lots of knowledge to share, uh, not only about youth development, working with some of the best young players in world football, uh, obviously working under managers such as Wenger, Ancelotti and Mourinho and uh, working to the the best academies in world football at the moment. So plenty of knowledge to share. I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. It's definitely one of my favourites. Uh, lots going up on, on my end, obviously, you know, the dynamic ball mastery programme, the online technical homework training programme, Program used by players uh, in over 20 countries now that's going from strength to strength also the club partnership uh, we're really developing our, our work with uh, several clubs around the world uh, including Wolverhampton Wanderers but also many grassroots clubs uh, supporting their players and their coaches with online technical training and coaching resources and also we've had the coaches past um, which is a, a coaches resource which uh, gives you a library of ball mastery and 1v1 skills but also uh, regular 1v1 team orientated sessions uh, team planner sessions to help uh, integrate the 1v1 work into your team sessions uh, that re- really important work uh, to help develop your uh, players uh, uh, technical 1v1 ability so just go to mypersonalfootballcoach.com to check out more and uh, without further ado let's get into the show So Dermot Drummy, welcome to the show. Oh yeah, welcome everybody. Hello. Can you just give us a little bit of background about your coaching, your playing and coaching uh, experience? Yeah, certainly. I was, uh, I think, at thirteen years of age. I was. Um, I joined Arsenal Football Club. I lived five minutes around the corner from Highbury, which was the old ground. Became a, an associate schoolboy in those days, and left school at sixteen to become an apprentice is professional um, and after two years I was offered a one year pro contract um, at 19 went on loan to Blackpool um, didn't make it in the league and then I ended up going into what was semi-professional football with clubs such as Enfield, Hendon Wildstone in the main that were in those days conference standard or just below so played there for probably 12-13 years and finished my career at a place called Standard and Puckeridge uh, as a player before my first opportunity came at Ware Football Club to be player manager. Uh, lasted about nine games um, and then I had a family and I got offered a job in Arsenal Academy which was in 1997 part time and progressed over a 10 year period to under 16 and youth coach along with Steve Bold at the time. And then I got a job at Chelsea in 2007 as under-16 coach, progressed to the under-23s in seven years, So, uh, and then moved off into the, the real world of football, which was Crawley in Division 2 of the EFL, um, and lasted 13 months there. So just, just tracking back then, tell us a little bit about your, your first job at Arsenal, your first experience of Arsenal. What was it like then? Well, it was a fantastic experience because academies were just really taking off and the head of Arsenal was Liam Brady. Um, And Liam Brady is a famous footballer played for Arsenal for many years, Republic of Ireland, but was one of the genius midfielders of his era. Um, And he then took over the academy um, and we we actually grew a philosophy uh, over a period of time. I remember we went with Liam to Willem Twey tournament in Holland. We couldn't get the ball off the Dutch teams and we were coming off saying we need something and he said Dermot it takes time and Arsenal evolved with a fantastic playing philosophy at the academy that brought through a number of players obviously and uh, for me it was an experience that you you know things take time to adjust cultures take time but you've got to be open-minded and evolve 
So can you just tell us a little bit about then? What was that? What is was that philosophy then? Well, we initially we English teams were direct, and we just started playing out from the back. Arsene Wenger would come along, um, so the teams would play through midfield. They would rotate in midfield. Um, wide men would come in off the line, um, but we we basically went very technical on the drills uh, under eights, nines, tens, probably to under twelves. Everything was just on the ball, different stimuluses, different tempos um, at Hay- the Hayland Academy until they got to about under fourteen, when a team shape come in. So we 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 basically worked with the ball all the time. And so, what, what what would like? Um, so, what was the first age group you took there at, at Arsenal? The first real the under 11s would have had Jack Wiltshire in it, um, Sanchez Watts, Jay Thomas, uh, Kieran Gibbs had joined from Wimbledon. Um, so that was quite a strong group of players that have gone on to you know respectively earn a career. Um, I had Henry Henry Landry was my first player, who's now at Nottingham Forest as a very young under ten, um, who's actually gone all the way through so what's what tell us then you know you're that and you you've got the 11s what what, what did your what was it, what a typical session look like back then it's it's simply you're working with the ball but you're 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 doing stimuluses so whether you're playing um three teams in different color bibs and two teams play against one but they've got to find a different color bib or whether you're playing two touch one touch or whether you're playing you have to go forward. There was, there was, it, was, it was conditioned games in very tight areas. Um, and what it meant was that the players had to think and see for themselves. Um, and this was developing their peripheral vision and their touches um, just by natural drills. They, it wasn't coaching. It was literally setting up a drill where it was a tight area and they had a theme to it and there was a condition to it. And then you took all the conditions away and played a game. And then you tried to see if that came out of it. You know, what the, and Some players would do it naturally. Um, other players found it quite difficult, but over a period of time, I think it naturally improved everybody. And, and, and at, at that time, what was the academy landscape like? I mean, obviously, Arsenal's got a tradition, particularly you know pre uh, Brambit to Chelsea, of dominating the academy landscape in London. And so, yeah. best players and always you know very successful in the youth cups. What was, what was it like back then at Arsenal in terms of with your competitors? Yeah, I think it was it was. Um, there was always West Ham were a very good academy not that they're not now but in those days West Ham were producing were renowned for quality of football um, and Arsenal would play a different way and even opposing coaches were curious um, I remember playing with Jack Wilshere's under 16s at Chelsea and Paul Clement was the Chelsea under 16 coach and uh, he, he, he said to me afterwards when I joined Chelsea that we couldn't work out your rotation in midfield and I said, neither could I. And, uh, and it was literally that they were given decisions to make, you know, and it wasn't you run everywhere and you dribble everywhere. It was just this, if Jack Wilshere had gone forward, Jay, you would sit in. or So they were seeing things for themselves, whereas um, the command coaching, I think, has to come a bit later. I think that's when you do need set plays and you do need situations. I think when you're dealing with, with kids, it's got to be very, very free. Yeah, I, I saw that, that that Lansbury group actually. They they played Tottenham in the the, the final, the Youth Cup one year, and I was at Spurs, and that that's, that was when Tottenham had Dean Parrott and Town yeah. players. But actually, that that night, Arsenal actually dominated that, and were like you know seemed like men against boys almost. What do you think? That's the key. That yeah, you no, know, it wasn't that because because you, you'd find that one player would come through a group, you know, and it was you got to be careful with developing in youth football. That, you may win at youth level playing a certain way. I remember being with Chelsea. We went to Blackburn in the semi-finals of the trophy. Gary Bowie was their manager. We're still good mates. They left out Phil Jones in the semi-final because he was with the first team. So we drew one all and we won the, the uh, second leg back at the bridge. But they put a player in the first team that Gary then told me they sold for £12 million. So the point, the point being is you can have a successful way of playing and be successful with results, but the ultimate aim is to get a player in your first team, to get a player, if it's a, a lower club, that makes money for that club. If it's Chelsea or Arsenal, someone who can come into the first team and be adored as a homegrown. So the, the, the balance of the winning, I always wanted to develop a winning mentality because I believe 8, 9 and 10, you line kids up in the playground and tell them to have a race they want to win. 
Don't ever take that out, but also be careful of what you say when you lose. So you have to have that developing winning mentality. But it doesn't just just have a winning you set up. Isn't the bill end because come seventeen eighteen, those players are asked different questions in the man's world, and so you have to start preparing them for that. So, what's your, in terms of your own coaching journey? Then, where, where did you sort of learn to coach? Where did you where did you pick that up from? Well, I was massively, massively fortunate because you know I was a, at the time I was a London cab driver. I'd, I'd finished my playing days and I'd done the knowledge. I spent eight years in the cab, but what it allowed me to do was work part time at Arsenal, and then I got a driving job at Arsenal, which meant I would pick up the likes of Jamie O'Hara. Justin Hoyt, David Bentley, take them to the academy in Hines Park, shoot over to Shenley to watch Don Howe, Neil Banfield, Don Givens, uh, great coaches. Don Howe, probably the best coach of, uh, I've ever seen. And then obviously I, I, we could go and watch the Invincibles train. You know, Vieira, Petit, you know, Henri, Perez, the back five. And then I would sit and share a room with Steve Bold. Uh, Tony Adams would pop in, Martin Keown. So I had a fantastic upbringing of... A, a fantastic club with great coaches, a great winning mentality. And then I took it on to work at Chelsea where, you, you, you know, you bump into Carlo Angelotti, Rafa Benitez. I spent a year with Jose Mourinho. Um, so my whole career has been um, very, very fortunate that I landed into an elite environment, you know. So I'm quite interested about that because you talk about when Wenger came and you, you changed this philosophy. So it's almost as a how do you then create that, adapt to that, you know, if you're, you're almost starting from scratch, you've got a blank page, you know, and you, maybe you've used to, you're used to doing things a certain way, how do you implement, you know, a new philosophy from scratch in terms of, you know, practice design and that sort of thing? Well, I think, I think it wasn't, you know, the, the philosophy, it, what I'm trying to say is you've, England have always developed technical players, um, we, we wanted to work solely with the ball a lot, and then the running would come later. And don't get me wrong, you need physicality and you need to run. But we just had a... Liam Brady was that type of player that was creative and was an artist. And that was personified, I think, in the academy. You know, we still wanted centiles to be tough and win the ball and head the ball and that. But we wanted the, the full-backs and centiles to be able to bring it down rather than just put it in row C. Um, and think for themselves and take a risk by playing out around the back because that made the pitch bigger. Um, it wasn't hard because I think the players enjoyed what they were doing. When, when you're going training and you're playing games and you're stimulated, I think if you stop stand still coaching all the time and it's the coach, the coach, the coach, the young kid's attention span, that isn't it. You know, you get on a bike and you ride it, you fall off, you work out your balance, you slow down and you go around the corner. So they were fading balls in and bending balls because that was the, the culture. So you gave them that culture in a way, but it was endorsed, it had to come from the top. I couldn't come in and do one thing. I was learning all the time, the other coaches were learning. Um, and so it was an easy environment because Liam allowed that to be that way. He, he didn't come over, stand looking at you like a sergeant major. He, he would brush you in and talk to some parents and then he'd come and say one line to me about the run makes the pass term or, you know, and, and you, you knew you, you, were, you were with a, a sort of world-class footballer um, and it's kind of easy then when you see in the first team on a Saturday with Henri and the likes of Ray Parlo, who's a fantastic player, you know, um, doing the real world stuff, you know. And then in terms, you were just like, you were given the freedom to do whatever you like in theory, as long as it fitted into that philosophy. I think, it, yeah, but it, when you say do whatever you like, it's not, that's not the case. It's a freedom to play stimuluses, to teach the kids to see situations. It wasn't, uh, OK, Jack Wiltshire, you play centre forward because you want to score a goal. It's Jack, you've got to be receiving side on and go forward and then time your run. So you're, you're not, it isn't a free-for-all, but you're working, the brain is working the whole training session to develop. You're trying to develop and work things out. And I think that's very important in the formative years that the, the kids do that, you know, that they, uh, they are allowed that. And then the team shape and the set plays and that stuff can come later. They can talk a little bit about then as Wenger. And how did he influence your 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 philosophy and the club's the academy's philosophy? Well, he one I think he brought fantastic players to the club and played in a way that you watched him train and he never overly was vociferous on the on the pitch. He would stop it sometimes and talk quite quietly. Um, but I remember coaching a session once and 
uh, as a guy was shooting, I was saying, get over the ball, hit across the keeper, la, 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 la. And I looked over my shoulder and he was looking with a frown. And I asked Neil Banfield, who's a close friend, what was the matter? And he said he doesn't like it when you're coaching someone who's taken a shot or an action. So this was with the youth team at the, at the time. So 18-year-olds, he still was that way inclined. So that made me, obviously, you think. Um, and then when you go and work at Chelsea and you see the professional players, they know what to do. Mourinho would create an environment that, and, and John Terry. And Lampard would create an environment that wouldn't go below a certain level. When the under 21s came over, they wanted the under 21s to be tackling them, fighting them, giving them intensity. So the, it taught me that the professional level, when you're there to stay at the elite level, the mentality is, is vital. Now, I then flip that back to say Jack Wiltshire that in training sessions, he would let you know if it was going off the boil. He wanted to be fiery, he wanted to be at it for 90 minutes or whatever the session was. So the, the, the winners, the mentality of everything is, is generally instilled in the young age. Um, and then it comes through all the way. And then the, the elite performers know the levels they have to train to to stay at elite levels. You, you mentioned Wiltshire there. Do you think you can spot that, that the outliers, the special ones at a really young age? Well, I'll give you, there's two stories. Wiltshire, definitely, absolutely 100%, just wanted to be a winner, never missed a day's training, trained with the youth team in the morning, sometimes came to Highland in the evening at Walthamstow with his dad, Jack, lived in Hitchin, so he lived and breathed it. Kieran Gibbs had come in and was the only player in the under-16s left behind. And by what I mean by that, he was left in the under-16s when all the other under-16s got pushed up to the youth team. He was technically very clean. His shape was fantastic, but his mindset was a little bit edgy and a little bit nervous in, in those days. And um, I do know that Wenger came in and saw him. I think he'd done some stats on him and said, this player will play in the Premier League. And uh, Kieran, to, you know, I wouldn't have thought Kieran could play in front of 50,000 when he was 15 and a half, whereas I thought Jack could. Now they both can. So there's very different situations in development where the worst thing you can say is somewhere you can't, you can't do this. And interestingly, a story, two players I had when I first went to Chelsea, Adam Jamili, who's now a sprinter, uh, and Alex Lazowski, uh, who's now a rugby player. They were both in the youth setup at Chelsea. Adam was a fast runner, but not a football minded. And Alex was just a, a very small public school boy. His father said to me, don't, don't, no problem, I'm going to take him into rugby. And at that time, I thought, really? Um, so it taught you in youth development, never, never judge wait and see, always believe in people and um, you just never know how it goes out in the long run. So you talk, you mentioned um, Don Howe there, what, why, was, why, why was he so special? What was it about him that made him such a big... Well, he, he, Don gave you the black and white of defending and, and some people will tell you when you've got a defending topic, everyone likes to do crossing and shooting. But when you're doing defending where you're doing blocking lines and showing inside, showing outside, front foot tackle, using your arms, get inside on... Uh, Don would strip down the, the coaching between one brick and ten bricks. And if he had to coach from one to six, he'd do it. If he had to coach from six to ten, he'd do it. He knew everything. He was he was a very he was probably sixty at the time, pouring down the rain at Shenley, and I was watching. I'm getting drenched. It's freezing cold. He's working with Ben Chorley and the youth team. They've done probably an hour and fifty minutes. We're all freezing. We can smell lunch. And the whistle goes, and I'm thinking, I'm thinking, great, we're going to have lunch here. They go in, and then Don pulls Ben Chorley over to say, right, get the balls, and he starts throwing the ball over his head, start, get over, get over. And he starts working Ben, and I thought, wow, this guy is, like, phenomenal. He's just a, a super coach, I think 108 caps for the England national team. And he had this drive um, to, to help you. You know, he had to... The, the, he, had the one in, he, he wouldn't just say something to you, he'd want to know what you thought and he'd tell you why. Um, and he, he would say something like, if you're showing a defender inside or outside, which is a lot happens nowadays, they come inside and bend it in top corner. So we always normally say show down the line. He says, well, what if you're marking over miles? It would go both ways and how do you do this? And he would go, okay, Don. So he, he would stimulate you with just with having a cup of tea and a conversation every day that you had it with him. And um, what, was the, what was the recruitment um, policy there at Arsenal what sort of players were they looking for or would you generally get in I think the, the, the difference when you're this is this might sound strange but when you're a youth coach or when you're in the coaching system 
you don't you're not in the recruitment side. Your the, the recruitment is down to Liam and David Court, Bobby Arbor, Steve Rowley, and they would bring you a player. They would bring you in uh, Jeremy Aladier, who came in um, in the Landry era. They bring in Fabregas, who was very you know pushed on very quickly. Uh, Nicholas Bentner, but you got the player to work with because it wasn't such a team based situation. It was can this individual go on and play for the Arsenal first team? Um, similar to Chelsea, Neil Bath, Michael Emanalo, Jim Fraser, they will do the contracts, they will do the signing of the players. Personally, I think that's a super thing because I wouldn't want to be picking a player that I'd agreed a £200,000 contract on. We're in development. You know, so the, the recruitment, you get asked what you think. And to be honest, I've got some right and I've got some wrong. And there are some scouts who've never kicked a ball, but they are the best youth development scouts. Steve Leonard at Arsenal can pick a player out that you're thinking, no, I don't see that. And, and he goes on uh, to be a top player, you know. So it's a di- totally different remit that I never got involved in personally. But what about, what about with, I'm saying with the younger age group, so you work on the 11s and 12s, you know. Play, yeah. You see, was there, would they have a type of player arsenal? Would they, you know, was there a certain... No, no, no not, not at all. You, 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 you know, you didn't say, let's, let's play. Look, I used to play Jay Thomas at centre-half. It drove him mad. Um, he, he ended up being a forward and... Um, same with Rowan Ince. You know, you, you sometimes fit them in where they can go and their the movement is less at the back than it is up front. And where they pan out in the long run is where they pan out at 18, where you think this guy is going to play here. This guy is going to play there. Ashley Cole starts off as a winger, ends up as a, one of the best fullbacks um, in Europe over time. You know, so you, 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 it's, no, it's no situation. It's a kind of... It is development. It is a time-based situation where people will say normally... You might find one or two. Wilshire's is going to be a midfield player. Okay, Messi's going to be whatever Messi's going to be. There, there's some standouts, but the others you wait and see. You know, they all want to play midfield. They all want to play up front. To be honest. So the next move comes. You move across London. How did that come about? Well, basically, there was um, I think there was a youth team job going at Chelsea, and a friend of mine knew Neil Bath and. I had a family and I, I probably needed a move and I said, is there any situation over at Chelsea? And uh, there wasn't, but there was another job come up. And I, I literally said to Liam Brady that, because Liam had given me such a fantastic opportunity, that I asked for his blessing to move. And he said, OK, you know, it was great. It was a, it, he expected people to be better. There wasn't a position at Arsenal. Um, I think Steve Bold had just got the youth team job. Um, so I had to develop and uh, I went and met Neil Bath. It was a long way from home, but uh, it was a bit more money and um, I, I moved into a totally different culture. And so what was your first role there at Chelsea as you went in there? I was assistant academy manager and under-16 coach. So I had a bit more to do. I worked very closely with Jim Fraser because it, my skills were on the pitch and Jim would sh- I would shadow Jim on the other side of it, learning a different part of development. So, so when you first go in there, what was your your first um, your first thoughts, your immediate reactions in terms of the contrast between there and Arsenal? The contrast was was quite big. It was that you would that the planning would be certain ways of working, um, and plans would be drawn up in different colours, and there would be a lot of off this field um, situations. Whereas at Arsenal, it was very much get to train and, and work, and then. Liam would see the best players and we'd push that through. And Chelsea was more, uh, how could I put it, that we would do situations. But I just went in and did what I did at Arsenal. Uh, and I think for Neil Bath, it was an eye-opener. Um, it wasn't that he was going to go, this is great. It was different. And I think the, the, the credit I give to Neil Bath is that he, he's a, a very clever manager that would go, OK, well, if this guy's worked at Arsenal and this academy are doing well, let's have a look at what they're doing. And then I moved a bit more into the Chelsea way of, some more organisational skills and meetings and I moved up the ladder to youth coach um, and my presentations were different on the computer. I started moving into the computer world a lot more, which at the time at Arsenal we wasn't so much involved in, um, and reviews with players and it was a, it was getting into the 2009-2010 time that I took over the youth team role, um, which was quite a big role. So it was more organised in terms of as a youth team coach when I went in there. And what about the, the, the plan philosophy, coaching philosophy? What was the differences? Or- that, was, that was devised, I think, by Frank Arneson at the time and Neil Barth. It was 4-3-3. And um, 
it was it was okay, but the difference was that Chelsea just had a point man, and they used to come to Hale End and play a point man, and I would just block off the the point man with a screen. Whereas Arsenal wouldn't have a stagnant point man like a six Ajax. They'd have a guy that goes in and comes out and rotates. And we evolved that. And I think the youth team that won the youth cup were Connor Clifford, Cavi De Giallo in, in, in the midfield um, and Josh McEachern. All ball players, Cavi De Giallo and Connor Clifford could tackle and break the play up. Josh McEachern was a, like a wizard and it was a very healthy situation. So I had three people that wanted the ball, two people that could kick and fight. Um, and we rotated and we overlapped and played. And to be fair, we had Jeffrey Brumer in the team, uh, Jacopo Salo, who's now back in Italy. Had a lot of foreign boys at the time, but it was a team that won the Youth Cup that was kind of, at the time, quite important for Chelsea. They hadn't won it for 49 years. And I think it was, it was in sort of something that was a fillip for them and for Frank. But now they've won it for, I think, seven out of the last eight, I think. Uh, and they understand, I think, it, you know, one thing is winning that team. What team, what players have come through that won the Youth Cup? Well, Jeffrey Brumer at Holland uh, is one. Sam Walker is playing at Colchester. Um, a lot of them are Connors at Dundalk. Billy Clifford, I had at Crawley with myself and Cabby. Uh, so we, although we won that, you, you've then got to make that next kick on, which I think Chelsea are doing admirably at the moment. And you, you mentioned earlier about the winning mentality. Obviously, I know my time there is a big part of the, the culture of the club. Can you just tell us about that? What's, how's that implemented at Chelsea? The winning, well, it is, it is uh, the, the culture I found with Neil, they, they've invested a huge amount. The building is fantastic. The, the facilities are fantastic. But they, they want a culture of person. They, they develop the person to be winning, to be professional on and off the pitch. Um, and the winning mentality is just demanded. Interestingly, at Chelsea now, you've got Jody Morris, 18s coach, uh, Joe Edwards, ex-scholar, Andy Myers, ex-player, 23s, uh, Torre Flo, John Harley, um, Ed Brand, all Chelsea players, Paolo Vieira, Eddie Newton doing the development squad, all the players that know the culture of the club and what it takes, some what it took to make it, some what it took that they never made it, but... They're all harnessed into Chelsea Football Club. And I know, Neil, he likes to throw in every now and again a different person from outside, such as myself, to actually give a tangent to it. But there's a massive Chelsea philosophy, which is a, a, it's a winning culture. It's a standard that they, they train to a standard, they play to a standard. So how do you, I mean, you mentioned it earlier, how do you balance that with um, development in terms of like the, from younger age groups to the older age groups? You're being like it's easy. It's simple. Look, it, it, it's simple. If if I've got to play, uh, let's say we lost to Schalke in the in the next gen series at the quarter final stage, and I brought Dominic Solanke on for a brief period, um, we brought a young player on. Um, we lost the game fair and square. We got beaten, but we looked at Solanke and thought, well, he's quite different. Sometimes you will challenge the younger players. Um, and I think it's important that you don't... This is where you can overbalance by winning trophies. If you've got a young player that's good, play him up. Play him in the youth team. If it's a good youth player, stick him in the 23s. So they get challenged. You might not always win the game because you might get a centre-half that's learning the game, that's playing against an overage player. So what? So as long as you understand the, the barometer, then you can see whether you're winning in the long run. You know, it's not... To me, it wasn't, uh, uh, we won today, we're great, uh, we lost today, but and make excuses. You have to look at what, what the team are playing. Are the team you're playing against all strong, all second years, plus over age, and you've got a young squad out? And I think there, there's always a balance. The results are not always the be end, be all and end all. What is the result? Is, is this player competing? Is he fighting? Is he challenging? Is he disappointed? I remember we played in the Nike tournament. We beat Charlton. In, I think, the semi-finals, the first year we won the Nikes at under-15. Player crying on the ground, John Joe Shelby. And I knew John Joe was at Arsenal. I wanted to say something to him. I thought, no, I'm the, I'm the opposing coach. But you could see in his um, eyes the tears, the, ang the anger and the passion that he had. And I just looked at that and thought, that's great. That is when someone's crying because they've lost the semi-final. That is proper. That's not fake. And they're the sort of traits sometimes... You can see in him now, oh, he's gone overboard a little bit of late, but he's, he's, a, he's a midfielder that wants to fight and wants to win every game. He'll train like that as well. So as a, as a coach now at Chelsea, senior coach, well, how did you 
go about continually to develop yourself as, in terms of your coaching uh, coaching qualities? Well, very difficult, if I'm honest. It's a very good question because I think you flatten out. Um, and I went in with the 23s and we, I was obviously working on a daily basis with Jose Marino, Silvino and Rui, um, watching how they talked, what their sessions were. But when you're working with world-class players, you're fine-tuning. So I didn't have world-class players. Um, I didn't have McCrawley and I had a totally different concept there. But you, you learn about the minuscule things, the, the attention to detail. You know, he's got four full-time analysis, how they beat. Barcelona by showing Messi into a block of three players all the time. The, the intricate side of it and the aura, the leadership qualities of the coach then come into mind. You know, he would have um, different situations where John Terry would say one thing and Sammy Leto would say one thing on the training ground and Jose is in between them, not arguing but debating whether the lie should be high or not. And it was how he managed those elite performers. And I think that's... What I learned that when you're managing elite performers, they don't need you to say you're fantastic or an nice your areas. They need a good morning and what you're going to give me today. What sort of session can you do? What what can you give me that I need? And um, so that was a very important thing. That it's more of a mind game. The higher up you go. So interesting. I mean, when you, how do you translate that into your youth team? That sort of you know, I'm thinking about you working, seeing Wenger work and Ancelotti. Yeah. Mourinho, it's an amazing experience. And how, you know, how, do you, how do you take that and put it into players? I mean, well, you, 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 you demanded. We had like Lewis Baker, uh, John Swift, Jeremy Boga, Andreas Christensen, Nathan Aki, Isaiah uh, Brown, really good players. They're all doing really well at the moment, in my opinion. And we just worked very hard. I had Andy Myers. Uh, there was A.D. Vibash, Joe Edwards. It, it was it was every day they worked. We worked hard, basically. We watched the first team. We drove the training sessions. Uh, nothing was missed. The preparation went in there. Um, and then I think we went up to the under Old Trafford and won the 20, 21s league at the time, I think. That was after the year I left after that. But that team had a spirit. We, we were trying to encompass a spirit in a development side which is not always easy, but they were playing for one another. They knew the standard. Uh, and that was that, that was every day of talking to players, communicating with players, you know, not just walking past them. How are you? How's the family? Lewis with his dad, Audley. Audley had worked with him since he was eight, left foot, right foot. And now they're saying, oh, he's technically great. Well, his dad, Audley, done a lot of that. You know, and you're talking as your dad. And you you care about them. You, you get into their lives because they're 17, 18. They've come into some lucrative contracts. They can lose their way. They can think they've arrived when they're not even on the train. And if they don't, if they're not having you as a coach or as a person, they, they'll look over you. And you've got to make that balance right. That you know you're treating them fairly. You're giving them opportunities, and ultimately you care about their their development. So thinking about then, because um, obviously thinking about your your development, talk about talk about the the next gen. Um, competition and going into Europe what was that like for you you know tell us about your journey there and what you learned from yeah it, it was fantastic it was we knew we had a decent team um we the biggest experience for me was going obviously to Barcelona um we won two nil there I think with George Saville Jeremy Boga in that team Todd Kane Islam Farouz uh and we it was really funny it was we were winning we got we had a guy sent off in the second half, in the first minute, we had to go down to 10 men and play a bit like Chelsea had to in the Champions League. We went 4-4-1. We're a bit negative, but we got a goal in the last minute to make it 2-0. And it was a real game experience. It was a game management experience where it wasn't about, well, oh, this is development. We had to win the game. Um, and it wasn't pretty, which I learned. You know, I wanted to play the beautiful game. Um, and then, then I learned, well, hang on, we've come away from Barcelona, winning 2-0, having a man sent off. The fans are happy. Happy, everyone was happy. The, the players had learned something that's real, you know. So I, I took from that experience, hang on, when you're playing the top size and there's a very little margins, you have to do what's necessary at times, you know. And um, that was my development as a coach. Um, we then went and played in Russia. We played Schalke against Lee Rezane. He scored at Cobham and you went, that, that guy looks decent. They had a wonderful coach who sat on a deck chair and you, you, you kind of had different experiences across the, the globe. Um, but, you know, playing at Lake Como, uh, losing in the final to Aston Villa was a, 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 a devastating experience. But nevertheless, 
I got a few things wrong on the substitutes. I left John Swift off the, the team I should have played. And I had to go home thinking I've done that wrong. And it was tough for me because we'd lost the final and I hadn't thought on my feet, if I was honest. And um, that that started me maybe reflecting when you when the higher up you go and the more public the tournaments are and they're on live TV, the more pressure becomes. Uh, and I had to start to deal with that. Do you think like um, you talked about when you were at Arsenal and you played Chelsea and Paul Clement? I mean, did you go? Did you play other com- clubs from like other co- teams from other countries and think, well, that's different. That's really interesting. Did anyone stand out? Does they have different sort of playing styles or anything like that? Uh, Tottenham were very good. Tottenham were. Uh... Um, when I used to go back to Arsenal, it would be the same, same as we're trying to play and they're trying oh, to sorry, play. You, but you get great games at Newcastle. Uh, sorry, don't you, we lost you there for a second. So you said Tottenham Tottenham were very good, were they? Yeah, they had a, they had a great way of playing football. Uh, I remember going up to Newcastle with uh, a very young team and Peter Beardsley was taking their team and we were doing really well. Got to 60 minutes, blew out and they beat us 2-0, I think it was. But Peter came over and was really complimentary about what we were doing. And I thought, hang on, that, that's 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 the, the other side of the game is where we've got to be mentally stronger, physically tougher. We'll get there. But they were uh, very strong against us, and you thought, right, there's more to come. So you picked up every you, you, wherever you went, whether you. And they they would come with an attitude, right? We're playing Chelsea, and it was like a, it was a street fight. It was a tough game, and you had to say to your players, come on. This is, this is going to be a fight. This ain't necessarily we're playing them here. So you had to get low. You had to take whatever experience you could out of the game so that the players developed. But what? So what about you know? For instance, what was the difference between playing like a Barcelona and then like a Schalke or like the Russian team? Did they have certain you know type of players? Well, they- you know, you knew Barca. You knew Barca would try and play out. You knew they would play out. Um, so that you would you could set a secondary press if you wanted to. You could sit off, but that you knew that, that what they were how they were going to play. You could go to um, maybe, let's think, not, yeah, Schalke were quite direct and they had their front man. And you, if they, sometimes they would play out and if you half pressed them, they went in behind you. And then we were getting caught out. So you, you, you just mix styles. But, you know, there's certain clubs that stick to a style like Barca's and the, the Madrid's. There's other clubs that are still are getting their own identity, I think, that they that had their first team play. And, and interestingly, when I spoke to Jose, when I first met him, I said, what do you, how do you want me to play? And he said, you don't lose your identity. And it's OK, I understood that because managers come and go. So the, the academy had to get an identity, which, you know, it's, it's, it's whatever it is. It's, it's developing a, a professional footballer who's got to be mentally strong, physically good, technically good. He's got to have everything. So you've got to, however you develop that, situation in the academy um, over the years can be within your own philosophy it can be sending them out on loan to a totally different philosophy where I remember one scholar went to I think it was Northampton and he he said where do I put the kit very politely and the guy said you take it home and wash it (laughs) (laughs) so you know it was oh okay And, and and my experience of going into Crawley was was totally different from taking some Chelsea players there but you know you 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 so therefore in developing a a young player, you've got to develop someone who is flexible, who is adaptable, who doesn't think he's floating on water because you're not. It's not. It's not the, the be all and end all to, to be a top player at an 18 years of age at a development squad. And, and what's the difference between you know, for instance, Mourinho and Ancelotti, those two really successful coaches, seeing from those from apart? What, what are the differences between those guys? Uh, that's easy. I think Carlo is is very uh, calm. He's very calm. He's very You know, massive respect for him because of how he went about his business. Jose, uh, obviously probably one of my favourite coaches, I think, was if he lost, he grew a beard. If he won, he was back slapping and he was happy. When he lost, he was a sore loser. And he'd come across the restaurant and you'd be, you'd be eating your boiled egg and getting your head down, even if you didn't have an egg in front of you. So, you know, it was it, he, he was a winner, Jose. And Carlo, Carlo is a winner. They, they both had different personalities, but both passionate footballmen. And were they were they quite open in terms of like you know in getting you in and supporting your development? One hundred percent. 
100%. The Carlo could, I, I kind of not, because I spent a year with Jojo, I knew him more. Carlo, I could approach him with Paul Clement and he was lovely and you could talk to him on the side of the pitch, he'd call you over. Jose um, came into my office and on International Weekend, he used to call me DD, DD, you're taking training. I'm like, all oh, right, you've got John Terry, you've got Aspila Quetta, Fernando Torres, plus the 21s, and I'm like, great. <laughs> and you're like, what do you want me to do? He said, you do whatever you want to do. This is a light sessions because it's an international week, there's no games, so the players needed, they, they weren't going to come in all the week, but you had to keep these players stimulated, and you did that by giving them possessions, uh, shooting, and a game. And he would watch them, he wouldn't go off to Portugal, he'd stand on the sideline every day and just watch. Didn't overly be comment or well done, DD. Rui would come over, good intensity. They wanted intensity for the first team because those guys that weren't on international break needed to do something. Their minds had to be intense because they knew 10 days' time they might be playing back in the first team with no games, you know. So with Jose, he, so it, it was lovely that he actually just went, well, crack on, you know, because obviously he, he, he thought I could do it, you know. And fantastic. And obviously, we've all got to talk about the, uh, you talked about, you know, the winning mentality and having success at youth level. What do you think is the major issue holding back all these, this, this young generation of players getting, uh, getting, uh, progressing to the Premier League? Well, if you look at transfer deadline day on Sky now, a lot of players coming in from overboard. I think it's the magnitude of the Premier League. I think it's the buying power. It's the tradition of the clubs. Um, it's the English football. It's, it's, it's a fantastic package. Um, and it's, it's worldwide. It's global, isn't it? You know, we have such a product that we pay the highest money in most of the areas. It's a, it's a, you know, coming to a London club or a Manchester club. We, it's an attractive package. So we are attracting players from all over, which m means we have to raise the bar higher. Um, and I think it's always been the same. I don't think it will change unless everybody went right. There's a quota of five homegrown players that must be either three on the pitch and two in the squad. You, you won't change it like that because the money will get higher. The top players will keep coming in. Um, you, you hope that, you know, Deli Alli, there's more Deli Alli's that started off young and has become a fantastic player. But you look at Dominic Slanky, he's still on the bench at Liverpool, but will he get his chance? Um, the Man City young players, if they buy Sanchez, well, what's going to happen? So I really don't have an answer. I just think it's such a product, unless we regulate it, that, that we've, we've just got to produce world-class players, but it's such a hard market. Do you think the loan system's working? Do you think that, I mean, that seems to be the route most clubs now are taking. Do you think that's, that's, that's got the potential to be success? Um, I think if it's the right loan, yeah. I think I think the perfect loan was Andreas Christensen to Borussia Mönchengladbach. You know, he's gone away. Um, he's obviously from Denmark. He, he can live abroad. He's done that, played for Borussia in the Champions League. And Conte said an interesting thing that Andreas will now, I think he'll stay because he thinks he's good enough to be, I think, in the squad. I don't think he said good enough to start. But I make that right. I think he's gone, you know what, you've gone away, you've done that. I'll now see that you are ready. I don't think you can just say they're ready because you've been in the academy for a long time and you've done great in the 21s. I think nowadays the, the elite clubs will send them away. Lewis Baker at Borough, um, that I've been championing for a long, long time. Isaiah Brown's gone down to Brighton there. They have to go and do it at, at, a, at a club underneath the top four to then say, right, well, we can we can take this person. Now, and I just think that's the way the loans are going. I can only speak for Chelsea, if I'm honest, at the moment. But they've got such a big loan group. They make money on the loan group nowadays. Um, so that's another situation. But the loans will work if they have the correct loans. I took players to Crawley on loan from Chelsea. It didn't work for me because I needed three points. So I, I can't sit here and go, well, yeah, just go on loan and you'll get the development. You have to go on loan and be good enough. You know, so it's uh, it's a it's, it's a very suck it and see situation. But you know, Chelsea have uh, two top people running their loan department with with Mike Lemonalo and Neil Bath, along with Eddie Newton and Paolo Ferreira. So they're they're giving it their best shot. So, uh, and who would you say was the best young player you've worked with? Who would you who would you pick? You had to pick one. Who's your standout and why? Um, uh, did, well, I could say Wiltshire because he's been there and become an England player, and I've worked with him probably for three years. I would put my hat on Lewis Baker um, because technically he's got everything. Physically, he's got everything. Mentally.
which is around the age. It's a big, big season for him. He's, he's my own personal choice um, that I think is going to come through. Fantastic. Yeah, I thought we lost you a bit there. I think we got you there about Lewis Baker. So you said mentally he's got that. Mentally he's got the... Uh... I think mentally he's had to develop, Lewis. You know, he's not, you know Jack had this focus. He, he was... And Henry Landry had it. Lewis, Lewis had all the technical ability. He grew physically. He went away to Vitesse with Andy Myers, who's assistant of Vitesse, and has grown mentally. He's got a good support mechanism with Jim Kelly, who's a family friend, but he's manager, and his dad is a strong character. He's he's got every quality in my opinion, but the, the this next season is a big one for him to go. This the, the difference is coming. I'm going to be on the stage now. I'm going to take this by storm, which I think Deli Ali had. He had something in him, Deli Ali. That went, yeah, I'm playing the Spurs. So what? I can do this. And I think that's the trait that you that isn't that can come. It can come with the, the experiences if you understand what I mean. So sometimes players have to be thrown in and then work it out. How do you prepare players uh, at these academies, these amazing academies like Chelsea and Arsenal, these Cat One academies with great facilities uh, for life in the lower divisions? Obviously, you know, a lot of them will go on loan to lower division clubs and many, you know, if they're lucky enough to have um, careers in football, will spend a lot of time within the lower division. So how do you, you know, prepare them for that, that contrast of that experience? I have to change that a little bit more and prepare them for that life. So not everybody is going to go into Chelsea's team. Not everyone will go into Arsenal's team. A lot of them will be making their living to MK at Crawley, at Yeovil. And, you know, I think Jordan Hamm's just gone back to Doncaster Rovers. Jordan is fantastic. He he played against us. He was robust. Spoke to Darren Ferguson. Loved him. You know, loved his attitude. Loved his character. So sometimes some of them come through with that skill. I think others, you might have to ram it home to them and fight them and tell them. Now, whether they see that or whether they don't, when they're on a lovely grass-cut pitch and having prawns and steak, (laughs) that's another situation, you know. So sometimes we can be a little bit, uh, it can be too good. I mean, so do you you answer that? Do you think we've gone too far maybe that to the other way where, you know, we've lost a bit of that, the typical English, you know, looking at the current maybe lack of defenders coming through? Have we gone too far the other way with in terms of technical training? Um, it's interesting, right? Because you, everyone uses this word typical English. Typical English coach, typical English player. And I'm like, well, I don't get that. You know, John Stones has come through from Barnsley uh, into Man City. I remember seeing him at Barnsley in the Youth Cup. We were having him in the next round and he could gallop. But he, he's a, he's a, a centre-half that can play out that will take risks. Because um, Shelney's the same. Harry Maguire was in the Sheffield United team that lost to the Youth Cup at Man U. Comes in and is a, you know, gone into the England team. Kale can head the ball. So I think it's 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 not that we don't want to do head in the ball or, or, or something like that. It's actually, you know, John Terry is a is a warrior and can play the ball. You, you, they, they've got to be both, basically. So there's no typical about it. There's Puyol could head the ball and he could play football. PK can head the ball and he can play football. They can have a fight or they can dance. But so what you I mean is that maybe, you know, we talked about earlier, traditionally maybe stereotypical English football, very direct and ball probably in the air more, where now as Cabin football maybe has come a little bit more continental, if you like, and maybe that's why, you know, there's not enough, maybe there's yeah. a chance of players to head the ball and do those. Sorry, uh, so I, think I lost you. Right, okay, um, yeah. Now, uh, going back on that, I think that, the, the certain leagues, look, we, we would go to certain teams and they would launch it, you know, in the Division 2. And it would just be percentage players, big number nine up front. That's direct football. OK, it doesn't necessarily happen at Man City or Arsenal or Tottenham or the, the elite clubs across Europe don't do that. And that was what you were developing. So you, first and foremost, if you're employed by Chelsea, you've got to try and develop for Chelsea. Secondary to the players that will leave, I think you have an onus to go, look, this is what it's going to be like when you go down on loan and this is how you've got to develop. Um, that, that, you know, I can't speak now because I'm not in it. It might be that they do that now. They start to prepare them in a different way. And um, I do know at Chelsea, they, they do cooking lessons, they do finances, they do preparing people to live on their own. Um, and you, you, you will find that the, the players, you know, I look at Deli Alley and think, well, look at his upbringing. I know MK's training ground was Public Park. He's come through. You know, so it is about the, the, the mentality of the player. 
that you look at, and, and, I, and I think that's experience where you develop that, that player. Can he adapt? If he's got to do it this way, can he do it this way? If he's got to do it that way, can he do it that way? Does he want to do it that way? And that's the situation. So it's, you, a coach can talk all day long, but if a player thinks, oh, well, I don't need to do that, then you're in trouble. So I think it's maybe a two-way situation of where you send them on loan and you see, you know, and then and someone has a second loan and keeps making the same errors, then you've got to accept it might not happen for them. What advice would you give to a young aspiring coach who, you know, sees the success you've had in a game, the, the clubs you worked at? What, what, would you, what would you advise, you know, they're just starting on their journey? Well, first I hope that I was a London cab driver and I wasn't a very, you know, I was a semi-professional footballer, so you don't have to necessarily be... Stephen Gerrard's to make to get into the coaching game. I know it's going that way a little bit now, but you can still get into good levels to then get a better level. You've got to, you've got to, you've got to want to do it. I think I used to leave sometimes my house at five and get back in at ten when I was driving with Arsenal, doing the evening sessions. You've got to want to do it. Um, you've got to want to learn. You've got to have a personality. You've got to be bright when you're communicating at young levels. You've got to be enthusiastic, and you've got to. You've got to know what you're, you're doing. You've got to know your knowledge when you're talking or, or don't talk. You know, the, 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 the people will suss you out. So learn, learn your trade as you go. Ask as many questions. Be very open-minded, but be, be driven and have a passion about how you want to play, what you believe in, what you think is right. And, and what about to a young player on, this, on, this, on the beginning journey, on his journey? A young player on the journey, I would, I would say... Um, use every tool nowadays. The, ga- the game has changed. Um, have a ball in your garden, work left foot, work right foot, work peripheral vision. So take your eye off the ball, try and do things looking at the wall, looking up in the air while you're working with the ball. The ball is king. You've got to keep doing it. Go skipping, work both sides of your brain. Don't just work the feet, so work the movement. Do everything. Be, be with the ball as much as you can. But then accept that you can go on YouTube to watch Messi, to watch Ronaldo, to watch Zidane, to watch, you know, I'm saying my era of players. But, you know, you can access all sorts of data, all sorts of nutrition. But the ball is king initially. But you've, all, you've got fantastic tools in this modern world to help you be what you want to become. Fantastic. And finally, what, for you, what's your, I mean, where would you like to go back into youth development? Or would you like to go back into, into the uh, first team? Um, I, I, I hanker for both. How could be, the football world is very it's difficult. I, I could look at working in China where they want to develop academies, they want to develop coaches, so there's a market for me to put my knowledge in there. My fiery heart says I want to prove that I can do an EFL job. Um, it's, it's either, I, I, my passion is either, if I'm honest, I'm 56 and I want to do a challenge. A challenge is the most important thing, so... Um, at the moment, I'm still in a the situation where I can look for work and I'm just waiting for an opportunity that's going to grab me. I don't want to take a job for the sake of a job. I want to take a job that I can think, well, hang on, I, I, I need to challenge myself. Or I need to get out of this comfort zone. Dermot, thanks very much. It's been All right. fantastic. Thanks. Thank you. Pleasure. Pleasure, so Good luck, mate. Take care. Thanks for tuning in to the MyPersonalFootballCoach.com Soccer Player Development Podcast. MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's Dynamic Ball Mastery Program is the world's leading online individual technical training program, proven and developed at the highest level in the English Premier League. Sign up now to train like the pros and take your game to the next level. Master the ball, master the game.